Wow, well, today I am more than happy to welcome Scott Katoon to the intersection. Scott founded Technori, one of the truly OG startup content and community-focused brands that contributed a lot to the startup ecosystem in Chicago, in my opinion, over the years. Scott is also a founder at Songfinch, giving independent music artists, or music artists in general, a new path to make money without having to be super famous and being able to let people buy custom songs for their friends and family. And uh, Songfinch was named the 166th fastest growing company in 2022 by Inc. Magazine. That's pretty cool. It's about to go up. About to go up. About to go up. up. And uh, Scott is also a founding partner at Off Center VC, a venture fund that backs non-traditional founders with a history of, quote, never giving up. Scott has a ton of history and footprint in the Chicago tech ecosystem. Welcome, Scott. Thank you. It's always fun to be on the other side of the podcast chair. (laughs) I'm used to being the one who's like trying to grill and now I'm sitting on the sofa with my friend here. I'm just <laughs> in the picture. It's our friend. Nice comfort bunny. What's going on, Matt? Yeah. Uh, speaking of, of podcasting, you've been in the interview and podcasting game for a long time with Tech Nori. Uh, how, long, how long have you been doing content? Uh, so I was working in commercial real estate in like 2000. After I graduated from Marquette in like 06. I was doing a real estate gig till 10, like 2009, eight, something like that. I started a blog spot. If people remember what blog spot was. Um, and it was like, I don't know. I was just ranting. It's just like, I, I hated everything about my life and my job. I just <laughs> fucking couldn't take it. Um, and so I would just like basically have these, these like things happen, you know, like little run-ins. Like I was working in Lake Forest and you see these people get off the train and they were just like really, like assholes and just like rich and whatever. And I, I just couldn't deal with it. So I started <laughs> writing these like weird long form. Um, I don't know. It was like a narrative. I don't even know how to describe it really. I, I've never really seen anything since it. it was like satirical, but like I would literally tell the stories about people and I would just like rip them apart. Um, and then at that point I was like looking for creative outlets. And so I, I joined uh, the conservatory at second city and I started doing that and some improv stuff and I just kind of, it started informing my blog. And next thing I know, I had like 10,000 followers of the blog. And I like, I had no idea. I didn't even know how to like check to see how many people were reading it. It was just sort of a random thing when someone was like, oh, I checked out your blog. And I was like, oh, what the fuck? Like, what is this? So <clears throat> long story short, uh, that was the beginning of content for me. I went to Northwestern, Medill, had the opportunity to work on, um, I think one of the very original influencers in the world, the Mr. Guitar Man. Uh, it was owned by, it was a, 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 an influencer and a campaign and creator that was basically managed by a group called Big Frame, which got bought by YouTube, which then got bought by Google. And in that whole world, like I, I just like had this epiphany that like individual content influencers is going to be the game. Like it's going to change everything. And so I started screwing around with podcasts like 2011, 2012. I did my tomorrow's business today podcast in like 2013. And then Technori, you know, once I acquired Technori, became 2016, the Technori or 2015 Technori podcast launched. That was where it really took off. And and now here we are. Here we are. But that like uh, initial blog you did had nothing to do with tech, right? Or No, nothing. I mean, it was, I mean, I guess there, I'm sure there were tech assholes that I was like ripping on. <laughs> I had no, like not because I was in tech. I had, I was just an angry person and I'm, I'm still pretty angry, but like um, I found other places to put it. Um, it was more, it was meant to be more of a vent. Like, I think, um, you're in a job, you don't love your job. You think you're meant for more, you can do more. You're not getting respect or credit that you think you deserve, whether you deserve it or you don't deserve it. And it was like, my venting was going to put this thing on, on this blog. And, and I don't, I don't even know that I thought of it as anything more than just like a, like a free shrink. And Mm -hmm. then it just sort of like, but it obviously turned out that like, I must have some sort of deeper desire to be creative and content. And like the very moment that I was at Northwestern, like there was like five, I was like law stuff. There was business stuff. There's all kinds of things coming at me. And I immediately gravitated to content. Interesting. And you've talked about particularly, I don't see a lot of people talk about this, but using content as a means and a tool to do other stuff. Oh, for sure. It was my collateral. I mean, like, it's it's still my collateral. Like w- for Songfinch, like we're raising, you know, we raised a Series A. We'll do a Series B sometime later this year. Like 
half the VCs that we talked to was a result of my show. Some of the case was them uh, actually listening to my show or like listening to it because one of their founders' portfolio companies was on my show or they were a guest on my show or they were a guest on my show and then they introduced me to somebody else and so on and so forth. Like, like that's still today, that's an impact. In the very beginning, um, literally, I, I had a pot. I, I went to, I remember, this is probably going to put me in a, not the greatest spot, but whatever. Um, I chose tech. Tech didn't, tech didn't choose me. Like, I was looking around in 2011, 12, and I was like, if you want to start a show, like, what do I love? Love sports, love gambling, uh, kind of like business, have a ton of experience in my, like, in my family and business, but like, I don't necessarily like love business. I wouldn't be like a business guru or whatever. Um, kind of like stocks, kind of like real estate, had a little experience five years doing that. Um, meh, no tech. And then I just looked around, I was like, real estate's too boring. Like there's just not like today with uh, fractional investing, real estate's a little different, but like then it was just not like <laughs> boring. Um, Sports is impossible. Everyone loves sports. Everybody wants to be a sportscaster. Everyone wants to have a show on sports. Now it's a little easier, but it's still nearly impossible because um, everyone wants to talk about sports. Mm -hmm. So you have to be so good. Um, tech at the time, to me, was just like there was so much green green grass and like the idea of someone becoming uber wealthy with a big idea or the idea of a company like rocketing up to a billion dollars or whatever um, – was a huge thing. And like shark tank was just kind of getting started. And if you're talking about locally in Chicago, 1871, it's like not even up yet. It's like, uh, it's about to be a hallway. Um, and so I just looked, I was like, there is no one in Chicago for sure. There's no one who has this. And like elsewhere, there's like no one really doing tech. And, and like, my thought was like, could you take sort of what, um, Mark Marin was doing with the WTF podcast and what Bill Simmons was doing with sports and and like content, and could I marry the two and then add tech to it? And so I just sort of chose tech. Um, and then once I chose tech, it sort of like the idea was like, oh, I start going to events. I go to like my first or second event. I want to say it was um, the Forbes conference was at the JW in like 2012, something like that. And I literally was like, this is amazing. When I talked to like I met Tom Gimble and Howard Tolman for the first time. And they were on stage, and then like everyone else is sort of congregating, and I was like, "Oh my god, this fucking sucks! Like, I can't do this. I cannot do this again." Events, still to this day, I hate them for the really? most part. Oh my god, I can't stand it. Didn't you used to do like five, six hundred oh, yeah. people at the Chase Auditorium yeah. for your startup hated showcase? You hated it. I wow. loved, I loved the part where I got on stage and I did my thing, and then I would immediately like. This is kind of a running joke. Like my producer Sam, who was there for my versions of this, and maybe attended one or two of the Seth Kravitz ones. Like the, the immediate difference between Seth's version and my version was that I would have two tall boys of PBR that I would walk out with and I would crack it as soon as we started it. And I'd nail that one down by the time the five pitches were over, I'd crack the second tall boy and that'd be the Q and a, and then I would exit stage left and that'd be the end of that. And there'd be a private group of people who I had like sponsors set up a dinner at Rosebud across the street. But like I would, I would try to run through the crowd as fast as shit I get so much social anxiety. Hmm. I can't stand it. It like, it became, I, I mean, one of the reasons Technori got away from events was because I can put up with a lot of shit, but like, it has to be for the greater good. Like there has to still be for the purpose. And when we started, when, when Seth originally started Technori and when I came in and kind of revitalized it, it was still about startups and investors. It was still a place where angel investors could meet five startups who had been very clearly vetted, had been prepared for this pitch and they could like do deals. And then, you know, as the community becomes more digital and people are getting more spread out and there's more startups of their own, the crowd just sort of shifted from like angel investors who had now migrated to like HPA and funds. So they weren't, they didn't rely on technology as much. And then you see 1871 and matter and M hub and all these things start opening up. We're like now it's concentrated. It's like if it's if it's product tech, I go to M Hub. If it's music tech, I go to Twenty One Twelve. If it's you know whatever, if it's science tech, I go to Matter. Technology becomes less necessary uh, on a localized basis. So I sort of recognize that like the people who were coming were coming to sell. They were just trying to like trade business, and like that wasn't what I was here for. Mm. So if I'm gonna sit here and support like people coming for free booze and drinks and or food and drinks, and they're just gonna try to like schlep whatever they're rolling with, 
Like, and I'm going to be stressed out putting this shit together. Like, I'm out on that. Mm. And so I literally was using the podcast as a way to locally meet people who previously would never have met with me. And like Tom Gimble, it's a cool story because Tom Gimble is the first person I met who was notable in Chicago. And he was also the first person, se- sorry, second person uh, to put money in Songfinch when we when we started rolling that thing out. So uh, it took eight years to get from the beginning of that story to the end of that story. But like the reality of the matter is like I started this thing off trying to meet individuals when I acquired Technori uh, and I had like basically put together this pitch for WGN radio and they acquired uh, the tomorrow's business today title. I started building like all of their podcast network for WGN radio, wow. which is what led to Technori that like, to be honest with you was, it was interesting, but like, I really just did it because it was like, if like no one knew what a podcast was that if I called you and said, I'm what on year a podcast, was this? 2013, 12, like people did know, but like not a lot yeah, of people. Yeah. It's like, I'd have you come on a pod and like the idea that we say pod now, and you know what I'm talking about is insane. <laughs> like in 2013 or 12, I remember guests coming on the show and they bring their like PR person and be like, when does this air? Like literally <laughs> thought like they were pre-recording for the radio. And it got to the point where Sam and I were like, we're not going to book any guests if we say podcast. So let's just say it's on like, we didn't let him, we never lied, but we just like let him assume that it was actually on <laughs> WJ radio. radio. And like, to be honest, like it was like, I want an old established brand because if I call you cold call you and I try to get to meet you, you would never answer. If I called you to ask to come on my podcast, you might answer. But if you have a PR person, they're going to be like, this is a note like podcast. What's that? YouTube channel. Like that wasn't a thing. So they wouldn't even join it. So I had to do a deal where I got the the show on WGN so I'd have a brand that they'd be like, WGN Radio, of course. Right, right. And then next thing I know, it's like a bunch of people coming in. And like that was the entire purpose, intention I had with it. Um, I made a huge bet on myself to get there. But like I had no intention of content, like of actually like being a content person right, and right, liking right. it. It's a complete accident that like I, some people liked the show and – now here we are like whatever seven eight years later and it's i'm still doing it which is insane and like you said you weren't lying all you had to do is reframe it a little bit yeah, so that it was more tweak. receivable yeah, to just, people just, just, a little a tweak, <laughs> just a little tweak but like after after two years like podcast becomes a thing right and now you get to like 20 i mean 2016 was still like a little like mm, pod that seems weird like now 17 18 19 20 right, right. everyone in the 17 got a 18. podcast yeah you you've always been invested in turning chicago as you say, quote, from a flyby station yeah. to a destination. And I've talked with Landon and Claude and various people who you who you know as well about this idea, but what do you think it would take to really turn Chicago into a thriving startup tech ecosystem beyond what it is today? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. I don't think I have the answer to it. Otherwise, we probably could do something about it. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a bunch of stuff. I mean... <clears throat> This political stuff is part of it. Mm. Like every I mean, San Francisco is no dreamboat. Like they got a, a whole mess of problems. Miami is Miami right now, but like really isn't any better. And like the poverty thing there is also real. And like the gentrification and it's like Miamians are being pushed out of their homes by rich tech bros that are moving. Like it's not mm. great either. New York had its crime for a while. You know, there's all these places that have their things. Like Chicago's not unique in that we have crime and politics. Chicago is unique in that the messaging around both internally and externally around our politics and our, our crime is kind of weird. Like, I don't, I don't really know what the reason is, but like, I don't know. I, I don't think of Chicago as like when I walked on the street, like we just got over the Lori Lightfoot run, whatever. And a lot of people like to say that she's terrible. And I, I didn't, I wasn't a fan from a business perspective. I was more of a ROM person, but regardless like, I don't feel unsafe. Are there parts of Chicago that are unsafe? Yeah. Are there parts of New Orleans that are unsafe? Yeah. Are there parts of Houston, Memphis, Atlanta, New New Jersey, Iowa? There's shitholes in Iowa, too. Like, there's problems everywhere. So, like, I think we have outside people who think it's funny to make jokes about the crime in Chicago, and it's like, oh, the political machine. We've almost branded ourselves yeah, yeah, as yeah. this, like, oh, the Windy City, and, like, it's just, like, this whole political thing. And we allowed it to happen. And I think all of the marketing that goes around, like who is Chicago, what is Chicago, has just been really piss poor. 
And then there's the part that like Chicago, and this is the thing I like about Chicago. We're kind of humble people. We're like worker people. We're, uh, we might be a little crooked. We might do some side deals on you, but like generally speaking, uh, I think Chicagoans are fairly humble and they, they like to do things in a, um, in a quieter way, not so flashy. And then you pay the price for that because, uh, New Yorkers like to be loud and they're going to say what they're going to say. And then you go to San Francisco and everything is flashy and tech and Palo Alto and it's, you know, sushi bars in the sky and all this stuff. <laughs> like, it, it, they're, they're, and then there's Chicago and it's like, oh, it's it's cold and it's pizza and you're just going to work. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like, and that, I, I, I really think that's a big part of it. And then the other part is, uh, and the, the part we can, con- like that part is, is story, narrative. And I've been in a million meetings with, uh, prior to, this new election, but like with, uh, even prior to COVID, I was like part of the whole world business Chicago. They had the community and the, uh, the, the, uh, committees and all this stuff. Um, I've, I've been in all of them. I just feel like we are, we just don't take a very good marketing approach. Interesting. The VCs are way too risk averse. I think we're getting mm. better on the early stage stuff. I'm sure drive capital here will certainly help. M25 has always been good. HPA for the most part is pretty good. Um, but like, we don't want to write big check sizes and we want to start with valuations, which to our credit are lower and they should be more like conservative because prices were too, too crazy. But like they're so crazy low that like they price themselves out of any real deals. So a song finch comes along with an opportunity and we can't get money. So then I got to go elsewhere. And like that should never happen. And then the other VCs are so like it's like follow the leader. The, all the major funds in Chicago either are going to be priced out of deals that are new to them unless someone cool from a FOMO, you know, FOMO fund is leading and when we'll pile in or like all of us are in one. So then we'll all jump in. There's not enough individual thought. And so what ends up happening is deals come here and like they come here to die and like companies that are really good come here and they start and then they try to fund it and then they have to go out somewhere else to get real funding and no news will cover a fund that's here in Chicago. It's like always just like if it's Sequoia or it's this or that, it's like in the news. But if I'm like, oh, we were funded by, I mean, Hyde Park Venture Partners is starting to get some some good clout. But like if I would have just said like Chicago Ventures backed us, like TechCrunch doesn't give a shit. And that goes back to the marketing part. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, lastly, I think one of the problems that we've had is it, it's weird. Chicago, Illinois in general, but Chicago in particular, it's one of those cities where like you leave here as a kid you always come back. Like everyone comes back to Chicago. It's like, it's a weird, uh, weird thing. Like Chicagoans just, they go elsewhere. They might live, start a family nine years, whatever, but they come back. And the founders are kind of the same way. Like lately we've had a bunch of guys go into Miami, but like they still come here a lot. Prior to, I would say the last two years, I did not see a ton of those founders invest in Chicago. It was like, oh, I made my company here. I might have got an exit or I might have moved somewhere else. But now I'm rich. So I have the opportunity to put into like all these bigger deals that like the fancy people got to put into. And they would just start putting all their money in stuff that was outside of Chicago. So it was like Chicago has a little investment, but not enough. Bigger VCs come in. Chicago early stage companies or early stage VCs never bring in a whole bag of money. It's just like a little bit, just enough to keep going while the big ones come in and take all the profit and then the founders come in and they move their money out of Chicago. So it's not recycling. Right. And right, that I right. think is the biggest reason is it's not recycling. Do you, And what do you think is the um, key to having us be less risk averse? Is it like encouraging early capital? Is it this marketing rebranding thing? Like, I think it's all of it. I mean, you start off this, this, question with like Chicagoans are humble. Like that's, that's absolutely baked into the equation. Like, I don't think you can, you can't take, like, I I think you're born a little, you can get more nuts over time, but like you're either born a little nutty, uh, or, or you're not. Um, I'm a person who's like, Oh, risk. (laughs) Like what, what, where can I jump in? Some people just aren't, aren't like meant for that. And I think Chicago has a lot of people who are more conservative by nature. And so, Therefore, uh, they are probably less risk averse. I, I just think at a certain point, you have to make a, an adjustment in your strategy to be like, what is risk? Because to me, like the risk of losing all these deals and the risk of never having a big win is more risk than the little bit of risk that I am already taking to invest in other stuff. Like, 
I don't know. I, I like the numbers for successful exits in Chicago are great. They really are. Like they're the top, but like the number of dollars returned from those exits right. is not. And that's the problem is you're like not taking a big enough bite. And you know, like lastly to put a pin back in the, the Chicago grenade, like I, I've traveled a decent amount. I don't think I've ever seen a city where there's like people are so vocal against it. Mm. Like it's a weird like the haves and have nots. Like I've been in New Orleans, and New Orleans is about as class, uh, you know, like class broken down as, as any place in the in the entire country. I mean, it's deep south comes from this like Creole French tradition. There's like people who are super 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 wealthy living on one street, and there's absolute poverty on the other street. And even there, it's not like here's what's going on here on this side of St. Charles Street, and here's all the rich people who are going down on Bourbon and, and Royal Street. They're, they they have like a unique passion and love for for New Orleans. We do this like self defeating branding thing. It's weird. Interesting. Like, have you ever been in a place where people are like, "I'm in Chirac"? <laughs> right. Like, you live here. Like, why yeah. would you move if you felt like that was yeah, or like yeah. Siberia? Like, you fucking live here. Like, what do you like? <laughs> why do we're so self deprecating? And I think that's it's part of our culture. And I think it goes into the fact that like we have the one of the biggest comedy places ever with Second City, which is self deprecating in its own name. Like it's hmm. part of our DNA is to sort of be like, you know, the un, the little engine that could kind of thing, which is great and has a lot of traits, but is bad. And it just requires a little bit more management, I think. You've said one thing that Chicago does have going for it in particular is its diversity, inclusiveness and ability for people to get stuff off the ground no matter who they are. And so I wanted to ask, do you think Chicago has that going for itself in particular more than other cities that's like advantageous yeah. to it and what why yeah i think chicago is like an absolute melting pot i think there's other places that are are more more diverse i don't know if more diverse is the right way to more put it more equitable but less diverse Man, i don't or- even know how to put it like i think of i think of like new york boston philadelphia washington dc chicago Los Angeles, kind of, not really. I feel like sh- the Chicago ecosystem in tech and business has this diversi- diversity. Um, what's the right? It hasn't fully taken advantage of it yet. Like it's latent. Yeah, like you know, like let's use let's use Boston as an example. It's so like Boston to me is not as nearly diverse as Chicago because Boston has, while there are certainly regular colleges in Boston. There's like four beasts, like top five, top 10 type colleges in Boston. And so the type of people who end up going to those universities, who end up staying either local or leaving, either tend to be transient because they didn't come from Boston, you know, proper to then go to MIT or Harvard or whatever, or even BU or even Boston College. So like top tier schools. Chicago has Northwestern and University of Chicago, both top tier schools. But then U of I, which is also a top level school, is not that far away. But then our city colleges are like real also. And then there's UIC and there's DePaul and there's Loyola. And you you have a combination of like Loyola is probably mostly local kids from the suburbs. DePaul is probably almost certainly local kids from the city and suburbs. UIC is mostly suburban, but like most of the suburban kids are coming for one thing, which is like not necessarily just one thing, but like is a lot of the pharmacy stuff, medical, nursing, et cetera. And then there's Columbia College, which is arts. And again, still, you know, people coming from local. So that means that they're coming here. That group of people is coming here and they're staying here because they're from here. But then there's Northwestern and there's University of Chicago and there's U of I. And those schools, people are trans, like they're flying to come from here. So you have a diversity level of like high education, wealth, uh, completely different background, Right. Male, female, across the board, uh, from the U.S., not from the U.S. From everywhere, yeah, everywhere. yeah, international diversity. But then that's yeah. like right across the street from two universities that are almost certainly city-based and local. Right, right. And those people are, are bound to meet. Mm-hmm. They're bound to live in some neighborhood in Chicago. And if you love, like, apparently if you, lo- <laughs> if you love pizza and, and snow, <laughs> like, you're going to fucking love this. And, like, and we had this huge music culture. We have a huge theater culture. We had sports that was very good for a very, very long time. Now it's like kind of whatever, but like it will be good again. Um, (laughs) There's so many famous actors, writers, uh, business people who live in Chicago, like downtown Chicago and in the suburbs that you have a very high probability of, of seeing somebody interesting, but we're not like a paparazzi city. So like that's a unique thing. 
And then there's the, the tech ecosystem. And the tech ecosystem is sort of put in the middle of like the largest, like if you were to go to Indianapolis, like the largest radius of a Fortune 500 to 1,000 companies in the, in the entire United States is right here. And so you've got logistics, you've got air transportation, you've got healthcare, you've got insurance tech, you've got marketing, you've got creative, like this used to be Leo Burnett and creative, you know, center. So like, there's so much shit here that like, it's almost impossible for you to come here and like not be able to find something. And then once you find something, you can become entrenched. And, and and, like, to me, that's why Chicago is such a melting pot because like the, the chances of, of you coming here, doing your time at a university and be like, I'm out of here immediately. It's just like, I've, it's rare. Hmm. And if you end up having family or kids or whatever starts here, well, then you're, you're here. Interesting. I love the way you you, are, you articulate all of that. That's very Chicago is unique. Um, let's talk about Song Finch. Yeah. Sure. So, you've said that Song Finch, uh, ca- cameo produces laughs and Song Finch produces tears of joy. Speaking of cameo, <laughs> you're good friends with Steve Galanis, and uh, Steve's the man. He started the entire this entire creator economy. I know there was Patreon, Substack, or whatever, but like Steven is the one that truly. Uh, galvanized and, and trailblazed this entire creator economy. The fact that, that Cameo and Steven are not on like every single Mount Rushmore of creator economies uh, is an insult. You're very bullish on Cameo and Steve. I mean, I am. I think they have their business. The business has issues that like every business, every startup has issues. Steven's awesome. He's been nothing but a great friend uh, and, and helper. I think he created a space. Like, like S- Song Finch is amazing and we're crushing it. And music is amazing. But Cameo invented something new. Music, we just unlocked music. Music already existed for hundreds of years. We're recording this in a music studio. For hundreds of years, people have used music to like tell a story. That's how you share information. It's how you share emotion. It's how you uh, connect with people. Steven had the, the balls to go on. Like He did it at Technori. It was actually the same exact event that Cameo launched was the same one Songfinch was at. July 2017. Steven walks on stage and had the balls to tell people that he's going to invent the new autograph in your phone. I'm going to connect you with celebrities and people in your phone that you can communicate with immediately. And they're going to be able to monetize their fan base. And you're going to be able to connect with them in a way you've never seen before. I'm going to put it in your phone. That's never existed before that. And every single thing for the, like, it doesn't matter if cameo ends up not working out and they don't have a big exit. And it just ends up, you know, shuttering at some point, which I seriously doubt happens, but let's just say it does. You will never think of the word cameo and not think of what cameo was at its peak. You'll never it like it's it it is part of the the global fabric to me now. It, it changed the paradigm for what you expect as far as your access with with celebrities or people you like. And mm. to me that that's such a harder job than me being like, oh yeah, Steven, you know, blazes trail and like I have this idea and my 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 partners have started this business that have this this engine of music that we can do something really fantastic with. But like, I just have to figure out how to get you to want it. I don't have to figure out like how to con- like un- like how to tell you how it works. Like you had to invent shit. That's crazy. I can't even imagine that. At Songfinch, you're doing something really interesting, which is tackling this dilemma of it being really difficult to make money as an artist. Yeah. It's, it's impossible. <laughs> Without having like a ridiculous amount of streams and essentially being famous, like I know artists who have hundreds of thousands of monthly Spotify listeners, and their music is not their job. Um, yeah. Less than two percent of all of the eleven million people who have posted some sort of music to Spotify in the last year made more than one thousand dollars. Wow! Like that's that's mic drop done. It's crazy. Um, 90, 92%, 3% of all music money revenue coming in comes in through 2% of all of the talent. The labels own 75 plus percent of all artists that have monetized their music to even the point of a dollar. Like it's so lopsided, it's crazy. And we came in with like, th- we're going to create, a, like what we had a lot of aspirations. We still do. Um, but the first one was like, let's create a, a middle class for music. Like hmm. That's the one thing that's never really existed. And so it's like solving a forever problem where if you wanted to make money in music, you either had to get a ton of streams, which probably required a ton of followers, or you had a ton of fame, or you won a bunch of awards, 
And so then brands would be like, oh, we're going to work with right, you. Right, right, right. In our world, I don't give a shit how many awards you have, and I don't care how many followers you have. All I care about is that you're how, really, you're really talented. talented. Right, 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 right. And like, if you work hard, you can make, I mean, more than half our platform, our average, we have 2,500 artists on the platform. The average artist is is making 24, 25,000 in 2022. 20, That's how much they made. Um, we have more than two dozen that made six figures. We have wow. another 50 artists that probably made 75,000 plus. There's probably more than a hundred artists making fifty thousand. We paid out, we've paid almost twenty five million dollars to musicians. Really, in three years. Really, yeah. It's like a crazy. It's That's like, really cool. It's a crazy number. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's like the it's it's the real deal. So you've got people literally like quitting their job and like becoming a full time musician in their basement, and it's like there's a a part of our our artist community who like doesn't want to be known like they use pseudo names they don't they're not trying to be famous ever interesting they just like love writing music and making music and then there's another part of them who like plan on using this to grow a fan base and then there's another part that literally uses to like they write songs and do this while they're in between tour you know so we we start by creating middle class in music and in doing that the the idea was that if we could be successful at creating the demand uh, whereas like Cameo, for example, the demand comes from the supply. For us, we have to create the demand. We have to make you want the idea of of making music, experience music in a different way. If we can do that, then we're in a situation where literally we have the ability to train the musicians to write music from the third party perspective. Previously, you look at any album you've ever, or any artist you know, um, their first album's awesome. Second album's a little less so. Third and fourth, fifth album don't matter. Because they've run out of experiences in their life to tell you. So we're teaching people to use <laughs> your life experience to uh-huh. like inform my stories. And you know, ultimately, I think it it solved it solves a problem for the artist because when you look at like Spotify's impact and Apple's impact with playlists, like n- no one cares about the artist anymore. It's just a song. You're just a name on my playlist. I don't even know who you are. By creating an opportunity for then those artists to work directly with a fan base. You will always know who Jeff Jocelyn is because he wrote the song for you and your wife. You'll always know who these artists are because you've actually worked with them. Mm. Well, let's talk a little bit more about what the artists do on Song Finch and, and what they create. You have these kind of like ma- magic moments where your marketing's pretty good too. I was watching your videos and I almost teared up on one of them. I'm like, damn. We there's there's <laughs> been plenty of videos where we like legit like people are just like in tears walking around the office. It's great. <laughs> it's these little magic moments where the person realizes that the song is specifically written about yeah. them and there's something about the song being meant for you and nobody else but you that the song has a new level of like influence on the person so i just want to hear more from you about like how you guys came to that i don't know conclusion or epiphany or whatever that conclusion came to us mm-hmm. um early like early 2020 when we kind of turned it from like not really going anywhere to like bam like rocket ship growth i mean from 2020 to now we've we've grown 25,000 percent so uh i think we realized that we weren't selling songs we were selling experiences and then giving people the opportunity to make people laugh cry uh smile whatever whatever the case you want to have and and i think in the beginning i would tell you like oh 95 percent of songs are anniversary birthday bar mitzvah like whatever i tell you holiday uh occasion based now it's like 60, 40 occasion versus just like, I want to make a song. I want to have a song. I want to share the experience with my, my friend or my wife, my girlfriend, whatever. Um, people making anthems, people making uh, entire albums to, to go to a bachelor party from LA to Vegas, you know, whatever <laughs> people break up songs, which is like one of the best, <laughs> best shit I've ever heard in my life is, is one of those songs. Um, it, people have just figured out how to use it in a different way. And I think what's unique about this product is, um, for some people, it's about t- happy tears. It's about reliving memories and milestones. For some people, it's commemorating a moment or a person, a memorial. For some people, it's a jingle and it's a joke. For some people, it's like a, a, a you know like a rap blast back and forth between us. It's like a diss track. For some people, it's an anthem. For some people, it's a podcast. For some brands like Coca Cola and others, it could just be like Toyota. It's like their song and their commercial. Like it could be anything you want. And it just sort of depends on us being able to find you the right artist with the right sound and the right thing at the right time to get it to you. And then, so like you asked me, how does the artist, how does it work? It's like super simple. You come to the website, 
or if you're a business, you contact us directly. Um, if it's like a, a commercial type of thing, but it, ordinarily you, Matt would come to the website and you'd say, oh, I want to get, uh, I want to get a jam for Claude because Claude, Claude's got to get something other than Meek Mill. Like you got to get him. <laughs> I, like I, I fuck with Claude. I like Meek Mill. I like 50 cent. Uh, shout out to Claude. We, we, but dude, uh, bro, we got, we, <laughs> We, we, I can help you. I got, we did, we've done 250,000 songs. I, I'm sure one of them, I'm sure 10 of them Claude will like. So you're like, oh, I want to get a song for Claude. In fact, I'm going to have like a three song LP for, for Claude. You can go on our site. We have a recommendation engine, or if you specifically discover artists on our site, you know, and like, you can pick them. There's a bunch from Jenna Fair. There's other ones from Chicago. Um, you can pick them. If you want to go to the recommendation engine, you're going to put your inputs. It's for Claude. Uh, you know, I want to make them laugh. I want to make them smile. I want to make them, you know, cry. I want to make them have like a great time. I want to have champagne poppy, like whatever it is going to be for him. And you write it down and it starts uh, pulling to the top artists that would most likely be a fit. And like you put in like Meek Mill and others in it and it will help figure out the sound. And then once you get it, you know, what's the tone? What's the melody? Is it fast? Is it slow? Whatever. Once you do that, we'll give you five or so artists you can look at. You click on them, you listen to it, you like it, pick them, select it. And then you'll write in all the stuff uh, that that you want to be in the song or the song to be inspired by. You can be like, I want you to actually say this, or I want this to be a story about Claude that's inspired by, whatever it is you want to write. In the future, we have all kinds of tools coming out this year and early next year that will actually like let, that tech will enable you to write lyrical, like write in real time. It's going to get absolutely crazy. Um, hmm. But bottom line is that is selected. It's sent to the artist that you selected. The artist approves it, says, oh yeah, I want to do this jam. If they have any questions with you, they'll go back to you, but like like 97% don't. They will turn your stories into actual lyrics. They will beat, uh, create an actual like melody, beat the whole deal. It's all custom. It's not reused. There might be like components that are at times, but like generally speaking, it is a unique song to you or for Claude in this case, <laughs> and they will send it back to you and then you will send it to Claude and he will lose his shit. And then he will do it to one of his friends like 20% of our customers already do. Interesting. Interesting. 20% of your customers, once a song is made for them, they'll make one for yeah. someone else. Yeah. Interesting. Huh. Cool. Well, uh, on a random tangent, yeah. what's your opinion on NFTs and crypto and the metaverse? Because uh, you, may, you make a lot of jokes about them on Twitter. That shit is dead <laughs> as fried chicken. <laughs> like, I... I've. <laughs> Man, <laughs> I have a couple NFTs. I got into buying NFTs because the market just wouldn't go away. And I was like, well, shit. Like, I run a business that, like, I should know about all this stuff. So, like, I don't I don't like to do anything that I haven't done or experienced myself. I don't invest in companies I don't use. Like, I don't – well, that's a lie. Sometimes I do. But, like, usually it, I try to be a user of it before. So I was like, all right, I'll buy some NFTs and I'll get into it. And you know what? There was some cool stuff about it. Like, I definitely saw no actual money to be made. But, like, I thought – like I actually thought people were just laundering money. It was just like, oh, bored ape is just like a type of coke. Like I think you're just buying coke, but you're calling it bored ape, and then that's how this is going. It's just drug deals, is all it is. I really thought that. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I thought that. So I bought this, and and I was like, there's a community element to it. The problem is once the value of drops and people's attention and time go away because there's no value anymore, the community is just fucking like smoke. What I will say is when I first saw it popping on. My immediate, I remember I, my producer, Sam Fisk. Hi, Sam. My producer, Sam Fisk, I remember texting him, this is ICOs all over again. For those who remember the crypto craze in like initial 2017. Initial coin offering. Initial <laughs> coin offering was some bullshit <laughs> that people were trying to sell. Like, you can now own a piece of my company through my through the tech coin that I, tokenization. Bullshit. NFTs is just a fancy, colorful version of ICO. And it all went up and crashed to the ground again. And honestly, if you're paying attention to, to today, even like the the searchability is an article that just came out today. Uh, I want to give credit to it. I want to say it was, I think it's Eric Newcomer. Uh, for anyone who wants to go to Substack and subscribe to Newcomer, he's fucking awesome. The search volume for AI from a consumer standpoint is today officially overran Bitcoin. Wow. So the interest level in AI, AI. in general now has surpassed Bitcoin. Which is like the real deal. It's crazy. So yeah, NFTs. Pfft, wow, the real deal. That's so funny. Well, no offense to any of the NFT people watching. Well, I can't speak for Scott, but no, no enjoy <laughs> it. There, there's cool stuff to it. I'm not saying 
not buy it. Like I lost all my money in one and I'm not <laughs> salty about it. I still own it. It's still the picture I kind of use in my car. Uh-huh. I love it. It's awesome. It's a piece of art. If it ever comes back and the communities come back and people are like investing in it, like do I think digital alts are going to be a thing again? Of course. Will it be the same, you know, brands and names, cyberpunks we know? Probably not. It'll be OGs like everything else. It's always like the collector's thing is OG. If the community remains strong, there will be something there again. And if you lost all your money in it, but you fucking love the community, well, then you didn't lose. Mm-mm. So like if you're an NFT person listening to this and you have NFTs and you love the community you're a part of, I was a bastard gan. I'm a B, B, B gan. It was my NFT crew. They're still funny. We still do weird shit on Twitter. Um, it's just that all of us have no more money. That's all. Wow. <laughs> so I'm not knocking you. It's just enjoy it for the community. But if you're using it for uh, your kids' 401ks and, and IRAs, <laughs> like, less so. Yeah, there's definitely something strange about the whole crypto craze and what coin was going to be up next. I remember uh, I was kind of in a bad place in my life and I got sucked into, I think I just saw a random YouTube comment, must have been a bot about happy coin is up next. And so I bought a billion happy coins for $100 thinking is that's well, long At least you only lost 100 bucks. <laughs> I mean, right. there's a lot of people out there who lost, lost a lot, lot of money. money. Yeah. Like, and there's, I know a bunch of people who were fucking rich. Like Bitcoin and, and Ethereum yeah, and all they've got them rich and they held on to it and now they are not rich. Like not, like sad. It's crazy. People quit their jobs, left the stability because they had all this money and then it just evaporated in a minute. And now they're like they lo- they don't have the same job anymore and the whole market's different. Like I love investing. I talk about it all the time. I, I have a, a newsletter I write to a bunch of you know, thirty thirty two thousand people about it. Um it's dangerous though. Like you have to know what you're doing and don't be a fool. It's important. Mm. Going on another little tangent, you talked about this really interesting idea in, in, in this other podcast about how uh, Shopify dis- disrupted Amazon in a way and companies like Cash Dropper positioned to really disrupt Shopify and that we're just touching the surface of these new tools that innovate on transacting and storing yeah. money and security. And I'd love to hear more about that idea from you. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what I was on when I was talking about all that. But um, <laughs> I, look, everything's evolution, right? Like mm-hmm. the original um, banking was in a bank, and the you know, like we talk about this with Songfinch. Like music hasn't changed in a million years. It's just the medium with which you listen to it is changed. Like it went from uh, listening to people singing directly in front of you to like all of a sudden there was like a big horn in a record player and then it was an eight track and then it was a cassette and a CD and now we stream it. Like nothing f- tangible change. It's just this little exchange. Money's the same. We used to go to banks. Uh, then we went to ATMs. Then you have to go inside the bank. The next thing you know, it's like, oh, you can go on a website and you can like actually do that. And then like it's mobile. Now it's an app and transactions are the same. Everything gets more mobile, more personalized, more on demand people get tired of waiting a day or four days or five days to shore up their accounts. It's only logical that, that you will continue to try to find a digital solution. And I think for any company that, I mean, look, like what I, I guarantee you when I said that, uh, it was before Stripe uh, had to do this most recent round at 50 billion instead of like 250 billion. Like Stripe was king shit. They missed their window. Like if any company that's in the, in the finance area or in the shopping commerce space if if paypal wanted to continue to crush they should have continued to innovate they didn't so what happens you end up having like the shopify's and the cash drops and the venmos and and anything in between the zells like we as consumers are just we're like we're not like that loyal like our loyalty mm-hmm. when it comes to money and shopping and commerce is more about what's like, the most convenient thing it's like convenient and security you know, like brand clothes, like there's people like my wife who will, will wear fucking anything, which I love. My, I love my <laughs> wife, but like she, the brand means nothing to her. Huh. I'm a little brand hoary, not a ton, but a little bit. I have brands I like, I like to like, I feel like it's part of me. Like, I feel like it relates to me when it comes. It's weird. Like what you would probably not like, you look like a stylish dude. You probably would not wear stuff that like you felt personal, like it didn't represent you. Yeah, I love wearing things that are made by fashion designers I have a personal relationship right. with. So I'm super heavy on right. the brand. And I think that's a very like your generation and younger. It's just it, like this is going to the point. Like it's getting more personalized, more on demand, more specialized, more me. 
And I, I just think like all, you don't have to talk about just Shopify. This is like across all business. Things are getting it's, more personalized. Everything's more personalized. Everything's more standard. Like it's, it's, it's about on demand, personal, mobile, now, now, now. And the more, if you're a company and you, and, or a brand and you don't buy into trying to get faster and like get more connected with me and more personalized to me, like I'm not going to shop here. And I think that's kind of, I don't, like I said, I don't remember the exact point I was trying to make before uh, that you're referencing, but I just know for a fact that like Amazon starts this whole thing by saying like, I'm going to get this package to you by tomorrow or same day. Then that just starts this onslaught of like, it's got to be on demand. It's got to be like, got to get it now. Got it overnight. I'm not going to wait five days for shipping. Like, brr. and then like they start eating up everyone's sales and then Shopify and others come in and like, Oh, you can just plug into a website. You don't even need to have inventory. Like I can set up a t-shirt shop for you. Like, like drop ship ready to go. And I just think you're going to see this evolution where people and brands are basically like one man shops. Mm. And I think you're going to look at like this, you know, there's a whole nother podcast here to talk about this AI stuff. I think you're going to start to see like where people are making a lot of people, not just people, a lot of people are going to have to be making their money like kind of on their own back. They may have one job. They may do one role for three jobs. They also do a little investing. They own a little bit of all the places they work. They also do a side hustle. Like, I'm not sure if you're better off or worse off than like our younger, our other gener- generations that had one single job. Like in some regards, it's more fun because that kind of sucked. But like also no one's ever had to live a life where you have to be able to have a cash drop, a Venmo, a yeah, regular yeah, job, yeah, yeah, W-2, 1099. Yeah. Like it's craziness. But like we're we're entering a world where – you got to maximize Doing your all skills. these different stuff, yeah. yeah. And investing a little. You, you got to do everything, otherwise you're gonna you just your your job will become obsolete by a computer. Yeah, that's the fear. Something you just mentioned that in the future you hope and you see that a lot of people will all will get more into investing. Yep. And using things like uh, Republic or Robinhood or yeah, whatever. What What do you see as that future where everybody gets a little bit more into like investing becomes a more general adopted oh, kind of man. thing? We were almost there. We're almost there. And then the economy hit the shits. And I'm not even sure it like really did. Like we've been talking about recession so much that we're almost self making it. We were printing money like fucking crazy and like Powell just up the, the rates again today. So like it's just getting worse. But Beginning of 2022, Apex, Bitcoin, $60,000 a coin. Everybody's investor. Go on Twitter. Everyone's got a portfolio. Everyone's talking about Robinhood. My uncles are on Robinhood. Grandma's on Robinhood. Uh, you know, investing in startups was as hot as shit. Robin, uh, Republic and other things were just absolutely crushing it. Millions and millions and millions of dollars a month. I mean, tens of millions of dollars a month being poured into startups. Uh, sports cards was at an all-time high collectors and comics you got alexis ohanan and gary v drawing fucking doodles <laughs> and selling that shit on the internet like it was it was the point where like everybody had something and then it all went away and everyone lost their money and so now they'll be scared to go back and that'll be the that's my fear but like it's all in cycles it's all pendulum swings so i do think that one of the cool things about 20 2020 through 2021 22 was that people got a taste they learned a little bit. They may have learned just enough to lose, but like I feel like every good investor has to lose their shit at least once or you don't know what the pain feels like and you just don't take the time to learn. So I think that we are going to come back to another bullish run where people are going to uh, be more shrewd about it. They'll be more selective, uh, but they will absolutely be more inclined and already kind of understand like ebb and flow. Like, okay, sale, asset, taxes, the whole deal. Like the people get it. And I think the more digital the currency, the more digital the invested, uh, investable is, the easier it is for Main Street to do it. Tech has been the thing that sort of solved a, like the broker relationship where like only rich people could do it. Um, Reg CF with fractional investing, Rally Road, uh, things like that. Uh, those are those are things that bring this to the Main Street. Like and, not having to be an accredited investor. Yeah, not anymore. having to be accredited where you're a millionaire or make you know a couple hundred thousand dollars a year for consecutive years. That's a big part of it. Like, but I also think you got to be careful. Like, I don't, I'm not telling people because you're, because you can, you should, Hmm. but I think you should learn. I think honestly, my, I, it gets misconstrued and it's my fault because I go on tangents and whatever. But like, my argument about wanting people to invest more is less about wanting you to invest more and more about financial literacy. 
Hmm. Like in college, I didn't know shit. Out of college, I was in real estate making investment decisions for other people, and I still didn't know shit. <laughs> like you gotta, like you have to have skin in the game to understand mm-hmm. how this whole thing works. And I feel like, you know, they like you should go out and vote. That's a thing people talk, people talk about. It's important. Your money is really what you vote with. Like at the end of the day, if you really Very look at true. it, like your, your money is what you vote with. So like if you don't understand the the system where your bucks are being put in play, well, your vote don't mean shit either then. Because like mm. you don't even know what you're doing. Like you're the fool. And I think the more people understand what their money is worth, you know, like this is completely off topic, but like Facebook and all these other apps that have been stealing your data. You don't understand what money is worth. So you don't understand that you were the product and you don't understand how much money they made with it. Right, right, like, right. They sold you 50 times over, made a ton of money, billions of dollars, and you, you're you just sc- scrolling away, scrolling away. Like, we got to get people to start understanding what this all is about and and be in more better informed about investing and know what the ups and the downs and be just be aware. And, like, not everyone should invest. And if you're not going to pay attention, then you shouldn't. Go hire someone to do it. Use a robo app to do it. But if you have any interest whatsoever, I think it's in your best advantage. And I think that the younger we start people, that's why we made one of our first investments was an early bird. I, I think the sooner you get people rolling and putting money away for kids and have them understand the value of what a dollar is or, or a Bitcoin or whatever we're on at that point, um, this is super important stuff. Well said. Very well said. Well, what's next for Scott? Uh, where are you headed? What's next for Song Finch? What kind of stuff do you want to plug for the conclusion of this episode. Yeah, I mean, um, thank you for having me on here, first off. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. Uh, I have one question for you, but it's a quick question. So sure. I'll, I'll do mine first, and then I'll, okay. I'll kick it to you to end it. Um, so I still write my, like, Technori got, got sold to King's Crowd. Um, I still do the Technori podcast. I still write my newsletter, which is Pitch Reviews, and it, it's the whole thing. You can go to Substack and look up Technori or Pitch Reviews or Scott Katoon, either one of them. Um, I hope people check it out. 30 some odd thousand followers on it. Um, it's free. Uh, check out King's crowd. If you really like equity crowdfunding, you want to invest in startups that are, uh, you know, very early stage. Like you go to King's crowd, you can like look up all the ratings we've done on them. There's 6,000 companies we've rated and done analyst reports for. So like you can get a, even if you don't invest, you can get a sense of like what pros are looking for. Um, so there's that. Please go to songfinch.com and buy a song. Try it out. Like I, I find it hard to believe you won't enjoy it. Um, and so that's a big thing. What's next for me? Uh, this. We got to get Songfinch to to a, a monster exit or or maybe no exit. And it just keeps growing. Like I'm, I'm not sure where we'll go with it. But uh, we've been doing some investing. We started as Off Center Ventures. We made a couple of, I think we're on our sixth, fifth or sixth investment in Chicago. Wow. Um, just did one that'll, by the time this goes out, it'll be out is Rivet, which... Oh, you invested in Rivet? Yeah, nice. So we, just, we just did that I've been, deal. I've been uh, Ange's, meaning to meet them. Oh man, Ange's, gonna... Ange's awesome. Uh, Landon from Drive Capital Chicago office led that round with five hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah. Them. Landon's so, been meaning to set up a meeting with me and them. I'm excited. Oh, uh, Ange is great. Great story. So, so like that's what's next to me. If Songfinch has the the success story that I think it should, I personally would like to move into like more full time investing. I've been doing it part time for a while. I just like it. I don't know how long I'll like it. Like it maybe doesn't go very well. I won't, I won't be very long. Uh, but I, I like being involved around the energy of startups. And I don't know that after like Songfinch is still so far from being, I mean, it's like we're at like the third inning at, at best. Mm. So like when that's all said and done, I'm not sure I have the energy to, to ever do this again. I hope it's a good <laughs> success story and that's that. Um, but that's probably where I'll be. You can follow me on Twitter at Katoon and that's probably the best place to catch me. Uh, but I have one, one dying, burning question for you. For Matt. me? Yeah, for you. Tell me. Where does Nonstop Matt come from? Where does what that is, come what's from? What's the story? Like, I mean, I'm getting that you're like, you're everywhere. Like, I'm guessing that's part of it. Like, you just keep going. But like, when I first found, I was like, Nonstop Matt. Like, I was like, click, click. I know I know this name. Like, I remember the name. Now I got it. Like, where, where did that come from? It's a very boring story. Oh. I'm disappointed. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> you got to work on the opener I, on that. This is about I, uh, it's a great story. I had a old, some old handle, and I've always been very markety branding. I used to uh, 
when I was in high school, I thought I was going to be a rapper. And so that's how I met all of the music people yep. that I still know today. And so I've always been very heavy on like overthinking what my name would be. And I think I was just on the brown line one day trying to change my Instagram handle. And I, it just came to my head. I was like, oh, I, I made a survey. I sent out like 15 different names on Instagram. And I was like, is this one good? Is this one good? Is this one good? I think people voted on all of them. And then I just chose nonstop, nonstop which was, that. yeah. I like it. Thank it's, you. It's true. I, I've seen you everywhere, like, literally. <laughs> like every place. I don't. I don't make it to events anymore. Now you know why. Like you can exploit me. Now you know why I don't make to events. But the events that I do go to every time, there's fucking nonstop Matt standing right there. Funny enough, I have I have a decent amount of social anxiety as well, but I don't. We should have made the whole show about that. We could have talked about social anxiety for. Days. I get it in awkward places, like if I'm at Home Depot. I feel like <laughs> <laughs> I feel like people are watching me. Or in like these strange places or at the Target or something. I feel like people are, I'm overthinking of people are, have you ever heard of spotlight syndrome or something? Like you think everybody's watching you. Oh or, yeah, I like, have it. I love it. <laughs> like, it's funny. Like, that's the thing for me. Like I, this is, I did not invent this statement. It was, I think it was Jerry Seinfeld, but he said, you know, he hates people. Seinfeld, <laughs> the whole show is based on this. And he goes, you know, I could go on stage, but like once I go off stage, like I can't talk to, you know, I can't do this. And they're like, how do you talk in front of 70, 60, 30,000 people every thing? And for me, it was tiny, right? Like it's six, 700 people at Technor events. And I would always say what he said, which is I can talk to all of you, but I can't talk to fucking any of you. Like if you put me in the room with all of you and like literally in front of me and I have to have conversations one-on-one -on -one, small group, I'm going to melt. But if you put me on a stage with a microphone where you're there and I'm here and there's nothing you could do, like I'm, <laughs> I'm like, I have no stage fright. I am rock and roll. Let's fucking party. Once I'm dropped into a group, it's brutal. So it's funny you say that about Target and Home Depot. Because to me, I'm like, <laughs> I fucking love it. I love walking into a place where I'm like a stranger in a strange world by myself. Like I live the whole universe. I have a wife and two kids, but I live like most of my life in my head, like completely alone. I think everybody does. It's I think they do, and they just don't admit it. Or there's the groups that need like the friends and the pats on the mm -hmm. back. When I get set into like I'm supposed to go to a this a, it's not an event. It's like a my wife's friends friends thing whatever something tonight. I'm fucking dreading it. Hopefully he doesn't watch this show. I'm fucking <laughs> dreading it. It's like I can't stand the idea of like this small talk and this like I feel like the world is closing in on me and like it's the wrong kind of eyes on me. So like it's funny you the spotlight center. Like I'm fully aware of it. It's it's a it's it's, we it's weird. Like I don't even know. It is weird. I was a little kid and I I liked to be on a stage. Like I I fucking I enjoy it. being on a stage as well. I like I like being a performer. Drop me in a classroom and I'm I'm silent and I'm hiding underneath my desk, like legit. Sports was the same thing. Like teams are walking up before the games and stuff and I'm like kind of like whatever, not talking to you and then like throw me on the court and the lights are on and the ball goes up and it's like let's fucking do this. Like it's I don't know. It's it's weird. And, like, it's weird to be in media and talk to people like you who have the same... Like, I feel like there's more people like you and I yeah, yeah. who are like, oh, yeah, we do the show, and, like, this is great, and everyone in your world thinks you must be the most extroverted person ever, and then they meet you, and you're like, no, nah, not at all. Like, it's total introvert. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank Crazy. you so much for coming oh, on the you. show today. Thanks. This is great. I appreciate it. Good to see you, man. Woo!